After my sister-in-law died, my mother cut off her hair, put it in a pot and cooked it. Strangely enough, the hair was like thin noodles, expanding and growing endlessly upon contact with water, inexhaustible. The villagers rushed to dig up my sister-in-law's body from the grave and shaved off the remaining short hair on her head. But it wasn't long before those who had eaten my sister. In-law's hair began to grow thick black hair on their skin, in their eyes, and even their throats. It was a year of great disaster, with famine everywhere. At this moment, my sister-in-law, Catherine, lay pale and emaciated on a tattered mat, her eyes half-closed with only outgoing breath and no incoming. My mother sighed beside her, there is famine everywhere now, and her family really has nothing to eat. He will I might as well go in peace. Catherine was an odd beggar. She had been taken in by my mother when she came to our house begging for food. My mother's original words were that, although she was insane, she had a big bottom and looked like she could bear children. And so Catherine married my brother, John. John also had problems with his mind. He had Down syndrome and was almost incapable of taking care of himself. But in my mother's eyes, they were a perfect match. It was just a pity that when the famine came, John couldn't bear the hunger and was coaxed and tricked into begging for food. With John gone, Catherine's inability to bear children, for our family, caused her status to plummet. My mother was also a ruthless woman. In the early days of the famine, when there were still some rations left at home, my mother waved Catherine away, telling her to get out. Catherine was stubborn and refused to leave. My mother made it clear that she no longer wanted Catherine around. She waited until Catherine was asleep before she started cooking wild vegetable roots to eat. Unable to bear the hunger, Catherine ran out and rummaged everywhere for food. Not only did she manage to survive for more than half a year, but she also became increasingly plump and radiant. Especially striking was her long dark hair, which reached down to her waist. As time went on, my mother became curious and secretly followed, Catherine wanting to see where she was getting so fat. She followed her all the way and discovered that Catherine was actually digging up corpses from fresh graves. But this time, Catherine was unlucky and was discovered by a relative of the deceased in the fresh grave. The man dragged Catherine to the door of our house. I said, how come your daughter-in-law is not getting thinner, but fatter? It turns out she's digging up graves. You are her mother-in-law, so tell me what you're going to do about it. In times of famine, people were starving to death and had no time to care about the dead. The man actually wanted to take the opportunity to extort some food from my mother. But my mother directly picked up a ha and smashed it on Catherine's hands and feet. You are really shameless eating anything whether it's human or dog. Now that I've broken your hands and feet, let's see if you can still run around digging up graves. Catherine's hand and foot bones were broken, and she collapsed on the ground, unable to move. My mother was determined not to have Catherine as a burden, but she was also a religious person, so she thought of starving Catherine to death so that she would not be guilty of personally committing a sin. A few short days passed, and Catherine didn't even get a sip of water. She was like a drained corpse, her cheeks rapidly becoming sallow and thin, that her belly protruded, strangely. Even more bizarre was that her hair remained thick, dark, and shiny, inexplicably emitting a meaty aroma. At this time, my second brother, James, ran out of the room, yelling it smells so good. Mom, why are you hiding the meat you cooked? My mother sighed repeatedly. James, if there really was meat, I would definitely let you eat it. Her words suddenly stopped, and she moved her nose. Indeed, why is there a smell of meat? 
Jane stretched his neck, sniffing around like a dog. Suddenly, he pointed at Catherine, Mom. Did you steam her? Mom, it's the smell from Catherine's hair. Catherine is hungry. She wants to eat meat before she dies. I thumped down on my knees in front of my mother. I still have half a bag of grain under the stove. Why don't you let Catherine have a full meal before she leaves? My mother glared at me fiercely. Do you want to die? Gulp. Catherine, who was lying on the ground, suddenly opened her mouth. Wide. Just now, Charles was just talking nonsense because he was hungry. If our family had any grain, we would have given it to you. My mother was startled and hurriedly comforted Catherine. You go in peace. And when you are down there, please bless our family to survive this famine. Catherine didn't speak. Her eyes were wide open, her eyeballs bulging and protruding, almost popping out of their sockets. But her body remained motionless without any reaction. My mother reached out to check her breath and let out a sigh of relief. She is finally dead. Mom, the grain under our stove was brought back from the graveyard by Catherine. I couldn't help but shout at my mother. Can't you just let Catherine have a bite before she dies? Slap. My mother raised her hand and slapped me hard on the face. That grain is for your eldest brother, Henry, and your second brother, James. They are the only two siblings in our family, and no one can touch it. I was slapped to the ground, seeing stars, struggling to breathe. Don't be greedy and lazy. My mother rolled her eyes at me and shouted, hurry up and drag her out to be buried. In order to avoid consuming physical strength, the villagers generally threw the dead directly into the ditch behind the mountain. But my mother was a religious person. She was kind, but also ruthless. She could starve Catherine to death, but she could also preserve Catherine's last dignity as a deceased person by asking me to bury her in the graveyard. I gritted my teeth, struggled to lift Catherine's arms, and half carried and half dragged her towards the door. As we passed by my second brother James, he suddenly stopped us. Mom, the smell of meat from her hair is so strong. It's like the smell of pork stew during the new year. James, you can't eat this. My mother hurriedly stopped him. If you eat it, God will not accept us, and we will go to hell. Mom, I haven't eaten meat for a long time. Just let me have a taste. James relentlessly grabbed Catherine's hair. He was very strong and pulled out a large handful of blood-stained hair. James, my mother shouted, but it was too late to stop him. James greedily stuffed the dark hair into his mouth, making a muffled sound. Mom, this tastes like pig intestines. Delicious, really delicious. My mother hurriedly said to Catherine, Don't blame my son, James. He's just out of his mind from hunger. Mom, you have to try it. James yanked another handful of Catherine's hair and stuffed it into my mother's mouth. My mother wanted to spit it out and refuse, but after the hair entered her mouth for a while, her eyes began to sparkle. This, this hair, it tastes like pork stewed with vermicelli. At first, I also thought Catherine's hair smelled of meat. But after Catherine died, I could only smell a rotten, disgusting odor from her hair. I pleaded with my mother. Mom, Catherine is gone. Please stop tossing her around. Let me go bury her. Mary, we must bury her. My mother, muttered, turned and went to the kitchen to get a kitchen knife. I cried out in horror. Mom, what are you going to do? Our mother is a religious person. Do you think she would eat her? Hi. <coughs> James had eaten Catherine's hair and his complexion looked much better. 
even his strength increased a bit. He pushed me away. Get out of the way. Don't disturb mom. I was pushed against the wall. Oh. Catherine was also thrown heavily to the ground. The back of her head was bleeding, and with thick black hair, spread out like a blood-stained waterfall. You are a beggar, and I took you in and fed you well, but you didn't even give birth to a son for my family. You owe me this. My mother held the kitchen. Knife knelt down towards Catherine and bowed with her hands clasped together. Now the feigning has come. And is cutting a little of your hair for some nourishment. You wouldn't blame me, would you? She muttered a few more. God bless. Then grabbed Catherine's hair and cut it off with one swift motion. I couldn't stop my mother. I could only watch helplessly as Catherine's beautiful thick hair was cut off. Although Catherine was insane, she was also vain. Usually if she lost a few strands of hair, she would collect them and tie them up with a rope. But my mother had obviously developed a taste for hair. She didn't want to waste a single strand of Catherine's hair and cut it close to her scalp. While cutting, she kept muttering, God bless, I'm doing this for your own good. You're a little mad woman, you wouldn't be able to take care of your hair after you die. It's better to just cut it off and be done with it. I suddenly felt that my mother's words sounded familiar. That year, I went fishing in the river, but accidentally fished out a female corpse with her head submerged and her feet suspended in the water. The female corpse was wearing red, and her hair like Catherine's was long and black, covering her face. I was terrified, but my mother told me to drag the body ashore. The female corpse was very heavy, and there was an iron weight tied around her neck. I had to use all my strength to drag her up. As soon as we reached the shore, my mother couldn't wait to lift her wrist and brush aside her wet hair. The female corpse's face was revealed. I saw that her skin was blistered and rotten, and her mouth was full of water with a small black fish swarming inside. But what my mother saw was a shiny gold. Mikla sat on the female corpse's neck. My mother had an idea and reached out to unfasten the gold necklace. The necklace was a dead knot unable to be untied, so my mother pulled it towards the female corpse's head. The female corpse's body had already rotted, and with this pull, her head was like a rotten pumpkin, almost completely shattered. Child, I am also doing this for your own good. You are an unclaimed female corpse, wearing such valuable gold around your neck. If you go down there, I'm afraid you will be robbed, my mother, also chanted, God bless and bowed, repeatedly to apologize. It's better that I pack your things up in advance. When you are reincarnated and come to me, I will return them to you. At this moment, Catherine's hair had been completely cut off. She was of no use anymore. I wrapped her in a tattered mat and dragged her to the graveyard. Many people had starved to death these days, and everyone had no strength to dig graves. Most of the corpses were covered with a thin layer of soil, but it couldn't hide the stench of decay. I chose a relatively clean spot and laid Catherine down. Catherine, go in peace. I caught her hair a few times, and then shoveled soil to cover her next time. Don't come to our house again. My mother is a living Yama, and the things that enter her stomach can never be spit out again. Alas, to be honest, I really felt that Catherine was better off dead than alive in our house. Before the fan when she was alive, she had to wait on my brother, cleaning up after him, and she also had to provide fertility value. When famine came, she was so hungry that she dug up graves, that my mother beat her to the point of paralysis. Bump thud as I was burying Catherine. A very subtle but jarring sound suddenly reached my ears. The sound was like when he slaughtered pigs during the new year and scraped their stomachs with a knife. I froze and quickly looked around. There was no movement around. 
When I lowered my head again, I saw Catherine's belly beside me was bulging high and constantly twisting and churning. Good hanging. I thought Catherine was not dead yet and hurriedly dug away the soil. Calvin's face was exposed, her cheekbones high, her skin blue, gray, her limbs stiff, clearly dead for some time. My whole body tensed up. Then, then why was her stomach moving? Suddenly, a large pool of foul-smelling, black-tinged blood flowed out from under Catherine's body. The blood flowed fiercely, instantly soaking the grave soil beneath my feet. I felt a chill down my spine and instinctively wanted to escape. But the next moment, a baby with a purple body and a shrunken concave head slid out from between Taffern's legs along with the blood. It was a stillborn baby, not yet full term. It was only the size of a poem and I couldn't tell if it was a boy or a girl. So Catherine, she was pregnant. I always thought her belly was so big because she was digging up graves. Catherine, my family, has wrong too. I cowed to Catherine a few times, then gently picked up the stillborn baby and placed it in Catherine's arms. Catherine, the baby is with you. Now you won't be alone anymore. As I poured the soil back onto Catherine, a Taoist priest in a gray robe walked over. He had a white beard and a compassionate look on his face. She has suffered a lot. I turned to look at him. Who are you? How do you know Catherine suffered? I am just a wandering Taoist, traveling between the realms of Yin and Yang. The Taoist priest squatted down, reached out and gently touched Catherine's wrist, and shouted, Rise. Catherine, who was already dead suddenly stood up straight from the grave, and the purple baby in her arms seemed to come back to life, its hands wrapped around Catherine's neck. I hurriedly stopped him. What are you doing? And you want Catherine to rest in peace? What do you know? Mm. A dead body giving birth to a child, one with great resentment, one with great grievance. If you bury them together in this extremely yin grave, it will form a mother-child evil spirit. The terrorist priest waved his hand at me, and a gust of wind mixed with yellow soil blocked my way. I couldn't break free and could only shout frantically at the taste priest. Where are you taking, Catherine? You must let her rest in peace. The Taoist priest walked away with Catherine and the stillborn baby. As the wind gradually died down, I heard his sigh. I see that you still have a trace of kindness in you. I advise you to leave this place quickly. Otherwise, when the evil spirit slaughters the village, you will not be spared. The evil spirit slaughters the village. Who is the evil spirit? And why slaughter the village? I didn't know. Nor did I want to know, because I wasn't afraid of evil spirits. I was only afraid of being beaten by my mother, and like Catherine, starved to death. When I got home, the door was closed, but the stench of decay wafted from the cracks in the door. The smell reminded me of when I was a child, and the cat I raised died. I buried it, but it was dug up by a dog and the dead cat emitted that kind of rotten smell. Mom, Mom, open the door. I knocked hard on the door, but there was no response. I had to go to the backyard and climb over the wall to get in. The smell of decay was even stronger inside, so strong that I had to cover my nose with my clothes. The source of the smell was the pot in the kitchen. At this moment, my brother John was adding firewood to the stove. He stared at the pot with a longing look, asking repeatedly, Mom, are the pig intestines cooked yet? I'm so hungry. I want to eat. Steam rose from the pot. My mother gulps and stirred the contents of the pot with a large ladle. Mom, what are you cooking? 
I hurriedly ran over only to see a large pile of dark hair cooking in the black pot. There were still traces of blood floating on the hair. I stared at my mother in disbelief. Mom, this is the last bit of water left in the house and you're using it to cook hair. What do you want? Wanda share too. John stared at me sullenly. This pig intestine is for me to eat. Don't even think about touching it. My mother also looked possessive as she picked up the black hair with chopsticks and quickly put it into a bowl. This pork stew with vermicelli is mine. Mom, on your son, I want to eat too. John rushed my mother and grabbed the hair in the bowl like a madman stuffing it into his mouth, regardless of the heat. This is the most delicious pig intestine I've ever eaten. You beast. <sighs> this is mine. What are you robbing me for? After my eldest brother left, my mother loved John the most. But now, as if possessed, she pushed John away violently. Fighting for a bowl of hair. This is my vermicelli. If you rob me again, believe it or not, I'll kill you. It was just a bowl of smelly hair. But my mother and John fought over it fiercely. I thought they were crazy. After the two of them frantically and greedy re-stuffed the hair into their stomachs, they returned to their usual loving mother-son relationship. At this time... John touched his stomach and burped contentedly. This pig intestine is really delicious. It would be great if we could eat like this every day. My mother swallowed hard. We don't have much of this vermicelli left. We have to eat it sparingly. Seeing that they seemed to have regained some sanity, I couldn't help but say, Mom, when I buried Catherine and saw that Catherine gave birth to a baby, my mother's eyes lit up. And she looked around me. Where is the baby? Is it a boy or a girl? I dirt my look. I don't know. The baby was dead when it was born. My mother picked her teeth with her finger. She dug out a long hair, stuffed it back into her mouth as if it were a treasure, and tasted it carefully. Your Catherine is so stupid. If she had told me she was pregnant earlier. I would have definitely given her the little grain left in the stove. I lowered my head and said nothing. But in my heart, I felt an inexplicable disgust towards my mother. Catherine was already dead with two lives. What was the use of saying such things now? Bang, bang, bang. At this time, someone knocked on the door of our house. Oh no, the villagers smelled the vermicelli and came. My mother hurriedly stood up and was about to cover the pot with the lid. But at this time, she saw that the hair in the pot, which was originally small in quantity, was like thin noodles, multiplying endlessly, becoming more and more. My mother was overjoyed. She quickly scooped up a handful of hair and stuffed it into her mouth and shouted at me, indistinctly quickly blocked all the cracks in the door. Don't let anyone in. I obediently did as she said. As I left, I saw out of the corner of my eye that the hair in her mouth was like a black snake swimming straight down her throat. At this moment, outside the door of our house, a large group of emaciated villagers gathered. They loomed against our door, their hungry green eyes staring through the cracks, looking straight into the house. Mary! What delicious food are you cooking in there? Let everyone have a taste, too. I hurriedly block the cracks in the door with my clothes. There's no smell, you're all hallucinating from hunger. You have food and you're hiding it from us, aren't you? But villagers were angry. In the face of hunger, people were no longer human, but beasts. They pounded on the door. Let me see what you're eating. The dilapidated wooden door couldn't withstand the beating of such a large group of people and began to shake precariously. I shouted at my mother, Mom, they're coming in. Mm. The villagers broke in. They all stretched their necks, 
sniffed their noses, and walked all the way towards our kitchen. I just found it very strange. Save you one thought, Catherine's hair smelled like meat. But I found it extremely fishy and smelly. Could it be that my nose was the problem? I couldn't figure it out. Inside the kitchen, my mother had already hidden Catherine's hair. The villagers were like dogs searching and sniffing everywhere. I clearly smelled meat. Why is there nothing here? Jack and Weber, who was a rogue and scoundrel, reached out and scooped up a handful from the pot, but was scolded by the hot pot, causing him to grin in pain. If you don't bring out the food, don't blame me for not leaving. Everyone started to chime in. We are all from the same village. If we eat a couple of bites of your meat today, I will return you ten pounds of meat after the famine. God, why are you bullying us, a widow, and her orphans? I don't have any food. I'm so hungry. I could eat my own intestines. My mother put on a remorseful look and kept patting her face. You are all hallucinating from hunger. You smell wrong. Jack touched his nose, and his bean-sized eyes turned to John. Is your mother telling the truth? It's hiccup, true. John ate too much, burped, and emitted a meaty smell again. Jack walked towards John step by step. I caught a mouse two days ago and was going to roast it, but it disappeared in the blink of an eye. Do you steal my mouse meat? John hurriedly shook his head. Jack's eyes widened in anger and he reached out to pry open John's mouth. You dare steal my food, spit it out. John, he had just eaten his fill and had regained his strength, hurriedly pushed Jack away. What are you doing? Get out of here. Mm -hmm. Jack shouted to the surrounding neighbors. He stole my mouse meat. Let's pry open his mouth and get the food out. A large group of people rushed towards John like hungry wolves. God, don't touch him. My mother tried to stop them by pulling and tugging at Jack, but this large group of people still managed to pull out a strand of dark hair from John's mouth. Jack put the hair under his nose and sniffed. It looks like a black crushing carp. Smells delicious, but within a few seconds, several other villagers swarmed up and stuffed the hair into their mouths. They were still not satisfied. Instead, drawn intently, as if they would cut open his stomach and take out the hair inside at any moment. John's face was pale. He turned his back in horror, facing the wall, covering his mouth with his hand, making a whimpering sound. This hair belongs to my sister. In law, if you want to eat it, go cut my sister in, in law's hair. Jack said fiercely. Where is your sister-in-law? John hurriedly said, "In the graveyard. She was just buried in the graveyard." The large group of people immediately turned around and rushed out of our house. They ran very fast, as if they would miss out on Catherine's hair if they were a second late. Magreed a sigh of relief. The old Taoist priest had already taken Takran's body away from the graveyard. These people would definitely come back empty-handed. After everyone left, one mother hurriedly pulled out the hair from the ashes of the stove and held it in her arms, as if it were a treasure. This is truly a treasure. It grows back when it touches water. It's enough for us to have a full meal. One. After a person dies, resentment condenses in their hair, which is called corpse hair. When a hungry person eats it, it creates an illusion that the corpse hair is a delicacy. At this time, a man dressed in Taoist robes, but looking very young, walked over. He had a strangely pale complexion and glanced at my mother coldly. However, anyone who eats corpse hair will die from your body. Exploding within three days. Are you trying to scare me? 
My mother clutched the hair tightly and stared at the young Taoist priest vigilantly. These days, people will do anything to fill their stomachs. I might have some indigestion from eating a little hair, but don't even think about scaring me. Incorrigible, the young Taoist priest pointed to my mother's arm and said, Today is the first day you ate cork's hair. Don't you feel itchy on your skin? as if something is about to break out of your skin. At his reminder, I subconsciously looked at my mother, carefully, and saw that her arm was red and swollen, covered with dense, small bumps. But my mother obviously didn't care. She pointed to the door. Where did you come from? You wild times priest. How dare you talk nonsense in my house? Get out. As the Taoist priest turned to leave, he sighed the land is filled with starving corpses, and corpse hair is slaughtering the living. This village is finished. I hurriedly chased after him, Master, please save my mother and brother. The Taoist priest stopped. Will you believe me? I nodded heavily, and saw with my own eyes my mother eating hair. My mother and brother have been driven mad by the hare, master. Only you can save them. Very well. The cellist priest nodded in satisfaction and said, To solve the problem of corpse hare is actually very simple, as long as you find the original owner of the corpse hare and perform a ritual on them. The original owner will no longer be able to use corpse hare to slaughter people. His meaning was clear, we had to find Catherine's body. But, but I hesitated. I don't know where the original owner's body is. The Taoist priest frowned, if I'm not mistaken. This corpse hair, you cut it off from the original owner's head while they were still alive, right? Yes, the original owner is my sister-in-law, but I really don't know what I was about to explain. But Catherine's body had been taken away by the old Taoist priest. When I saw Jack and a large group of villagers holding a pile of dark fine hair running home excitedly, I was stunned that the hair in Jack's hands was very short. It was clearly Catherine's hair. But wasn't Catherine taken away? How did they get the hair? Don't hide anything from me. The Taoist priest patted me on the shoulder and looked at me. This corpse hair will cause hallucinations. Whatever food the hungry person desires the most, it will transform into that. Once a person eats it, they will surely die. Come. They found Catherine's hair in the graveyard. Won't they? She reads in the graveyard. I read the Taos priest toward the graveyard. At this moment, Catherine was lying in the shallow pit. Her mouth and eyes were still wide open. But her head was completely bald. Even her scalp had been scraped clean by those villagers. What made me even more angry was that Catherine's eyeballs had been carved with words. The words were very small, almost invisible unless you looked closely. I clenched my fists tightly. These villagers were truly beasts. Not only did they cut off her hair, they even desecrated her corpse. Such strong resentment. The Taoist priest did not approach Catherine. He stood where he was, clasped his hands together, and chanted a few scriptures for the dead. Then he said to me, I will chant scriptures to help her transcend. You go home quickly and get a piece of red cloth. I ran back home, took a piece of red cloth, and ran back to the graveyard, asking the Taoist priest what should we do now. He said without hesitation, in ancient times men revered yellow and women revered red. You use this red cloth to wrap your sister-in-law. It can quell her anger. I spread out the red cloth and wanted him to help. But he refused. I have cultivation. My body is full of righteousness. Once I touch her, not only will it not quell her resentment, it will only provoke her. I had no choice but to laboriously move Catherine on to the red cloth by myself and wrap her up little by little. 
At this moment, the sky, which had been clear and cloudless, suddenly became overcast with strong winds and thunder. The tallest priest's expression turned serious. Your Catherine has already gained momentum. Simply wrapping her in red cloth and burying her may not be enough. Then what should we do? I hurriedly knelt towards Catherine and kowtowed repeatedly. Catherine, this world is too bitter. You should just go in peace. Since she refuses a toast, I had no choice but to give her a forfeit. The Taoist priest chanted a few more scriptures. The thunder in the sky became louder and harsher. But not a single drop of rain fell. After he finished chanting the scriptures, he said to me, Go home and get an iron weight. I was about to agree. But then I suddenly thought of the female corpse I had fished out of the river a long time ago. I remembered that the female corpse was also wearing red clothes and had an iron weight tied around her neck. I became wary. And couldn't you help but ask, what do you need the weight for? The Taoist priest glanced at me indifferently. My cultivation is limited. I can't help her transcend. I can only seal her. Seal my sister-in-law with an iron weight. I couldn't help but say, do you want me to tie the weight around her neck with a rope in a head down feet up position and sink her to the bottom of the river? A hint of surprise flashed in the serious priest's eyes. This is a unique sealing technique. How did you know? Before I could answer, he narrowed his eyes slightly, unless you have fished out such a female corpse before. I nodded. Yes, I have fished one out before, but I won't let you do this to my Catherine. She suffered enough when she was alive. I don't want her to be forever, submerged in the water after death eaten by fish and shrimp. I'm also doing this for the good of everyone in your village. I will put your Catherine in a riverbed, and then she will never be able to come ashore to harm people again. I will place the weight on your Catherine's head and submerge her upside down at the bottom of the river. Oh well, this way she won't be able to walk and won't be able to hurt anyone in the river. The Taoist priest exclaimed patiently. Moreover, it is a famine year now. The river has long since dried up. There will be no fish or shrimp to nibble. On her ear, Catherine will not feel too uncomfortable. I bit my lip and remained silent. Catherine suffered enough in life. Did she have to endure such torture and death as well? Seeing that I didn't respond for a long time, the tallest pressed frowned and said, You better think about it carefully. Your Catherine is full of resentment now. If we don't do this, everyone in your village will be slaughtered by her. Everyone in the village would be slaughtered by Catherine. I took a deep breath. My originally firm resolve suddenly wavered. After a long time, I agreed, okay, I'll go home and get the weight. In the end, I dug a vertical pit in the dry river bed. I placed Catherine, wrapped in red cloth, upside down in the pit. After doing all this, I knelt down and told to capture in a few times before asking the Tavids, No, my Catherine will really never harm anyone in the village again, right? The Taoist priest ignored me. He bit his finger, drew a few strokes in the air, and a blood-stained yellow talisman floated down from the air. The talisman landed on the spot where Catherine was buried and disappeared instantly. As the tallest priest again, my mother and brother will be fine too, right? The tallest priest nodded. Yes. I was overjoyed and hurriedly ran towards home. My house was located in the middle of the village. As soon as I entered the village, I felt something was wrong. Before the rotten smell only came from my house, but now it seemed to permeate the entire village. My heart began to feel uneasy. Didn't the Taoist priest say that Catherine wouldn't hurt anyone again? With a heart full of trepidation, I ran home 
and saw my mother and John like tireless puppets, constantly repeating the stiff motion of stuffing hair from the pot into their mouths. And what terrified me the more was that I saw a strand of hair growing from my mother's thigh. The hair was like a vine growing longer and longer, gradually spreading across her highball and down to the corner of her mouth. My mother seemed to feel something and screamed, covering her eyes. It hurts. Mom, I'll help you pull it out. Just as I was about to reach out, I heard John scream in terror. Help me, my mouth hurts. I turned to look at John and saw that his entire tongue was covered with a layer of light black fuzz. The fuzz was growing wildly quickly, filling John's entire throat. Ah, it hurts, it hurts. My mother and John clutched the parts of their bodies where the hair was growing, crying in pain, but on the other hand, they kept chewing on the hair. I steeled myself and took a pair of scissors to cut off the extra hair on their bodies that didn't belong to them. But after the scissors cut off the hair and bright red blood dripped out, my mother and John cried out even louder in pain. After more than ten minutes, my mother's eyeballs were completely covered with hair. My brother had completely turned into a monster, his entire head covered in black, greasy hair. I was terrified. Didn't Rutilla's priest Cecile Catherine away? Why was her hair still hurting people? I hurriedly ran out of the house, wanting to confront the Talus priest. But he was gone, nowhere to be found. I finally realized he tricked me. I ran back to where Catherine was buried, wanting to dig her out. But this time, the soil my fingertips touched became as hard as I am. I couldn't move a single cord. I knelt on the ground, tears streaming down my face. Catherine was sealed. My mother and John were also in trouble. I was truly useless. When I returned from home again, all that remained were the corpses of my mother and John. My mother's body was like a shredded carrot laying in a haphazard heap on a pile of dark hair. And my brother, most of his body had been shredded by the hair. Thick strands of hair, like thin steel wires, protruded from his body. Blood gushed out like a broken dam. His legs also reduced to shreds on the ground. Eh, uh, I screamed my eyes bloodshot. After one night, except for me, the bodies of everyone in the village had been shredded by Catherine's hair. The village was filled with the stench of decay and the smell of blood. I fought back fear and wrapped the shared remains of my mother and John in sheets preparing to bury them. At this moment, the young tallest priest appeared again. Overnight, he had aged significantly. His originally fair skin was now covered with wrinkles, and his hair had turned white. I glared at him angrily. You lied to me. He looked even angrier than I did and suddenly reached out and choked my neck. You dared to play tricks on me. The female corpse in the liver not only failed to absorb the energy for me, but also devoured decades of my lifespan. <sighs> I didn't understand what he was talking about. I only knew that I hated him, and I couldn't defeat him. The oxygen in my lungs was slowly being squeezed out. Just when I thought I was about to die, the old tallest, priest one who had taken Catherine and the dead baby away, appeared in my line of sight. He held a large black umbrella in his left hand and said with a smile, Seen your brother a long time, no, see. I was a little taken aback. The young tallest priest clearly looked much younger than the old one. But the old one actually addressed the young one as senior brother. It's you, the young tallest priest abruptly released me and struck out a palm towards the old one. I should have known you set up this backlash trap. The old tallest priest lightly waved his umbrella, effortlessly dissolving the attack, and said calmly, I had already carved words in the female corpses, eyes casting a curse. Not only would she not prolong your life, she would absorb your essence instead. 
The young Taoist priest's face was filled with hatred and anger. Why did you set me up? For the sake of all living beings, you kill and harm the dead. Such cruelty and inhumanity are intolerable by heaven and earth. The old tailless priest walked slowly towards the young one. Back then, for the sake of immortality, he nailed that junior sister, alive to the bottom of the river, using her to absorb yet energy and become an immortality pillar. Now, our junior sister was unintentionally pulled out by this girl. He used evil methods again, using the resentful dead body as a pillar to prolong your life. Senior brother, for the sake of immortality, you have lost all humanity. How could I not set up a trap to destroy you? Although I have lost ten years of cultivation, it is still more than enough to defeat you. The young police priest leaped into the air, and a wisp of black mist gathered in his palm. With a wave of his hand, the black mist surged towards the old tellist priest. The old Saurist priest stretched out his hand, and a pitch black infant appeared in his palm. As soon as the infant touched the ground, its body began to swell, rapidly growing larger and larger, as if the entire room could not contain it. At this moment, it opened its mouth wide, easily swallowing the black mist. The young Taoist priest's face was full of terror. He instinctively wanted to flee, but the infant's wide, open mouth lunged towards him in one gulp. The young Taoist priest was dead. He was devoured by the infant bite. Bite? I felt immense pain. I knew very well that this infant was the stillborn child Catherine had given birth to. The young Taoist priest was not a good person. But this old Taoist priest, he would not let the dead infant rest in peace. He was not a good person, either. But none of this mattered to me anymore. I... I seem to be dying, too. The prolonged lack of food, coupled with being choked by the young Tao priest earlier, my vision was gradually fading to black, as if I would stop breathing in the next second. After devouring the young Talis priest, the infant's body gradually shrank returning to the old Talis priest's palm. The old Talis priest was about to turn and leave, but as if he thought of something, he stopped beside me and sighed, My senior brother's magic is very powerful. If not for the help of the corpse infant, I would not have been able to defeat him. Suddenly, he chuckled self, deprecatingly. Why am I explaining this to you? He was about to leave, but driven by a strong survival instinct, I subconsciously reached out and grabbed him. Save, save me. He crouched down and looked at me. Life and death are determined by the natural order. I shouldn't interfere, but, seeing your kind heart, I am willing to defy heaven and save you. Are you one? I nodded instinctively. Yes. A smile appeared on the old tithed priest's lips. The next moment, the dead infant in his palm crawled towards my lower body. And at this moment, I saw that in the black umbrella in his hand, Catherine was hidden. Catherine walked towards me step by step. Catherine's soul entered my body. Catherine's soul entered my body. My soul was gradually squeezed out of my shell. I felt as if my body was being torn apart by an unbearable pain. Just as the darkness was about to consume me, completely, I saw Catherine's child also enter my womb. When I regained consciousness, I found myself permanently trapped in Catherine's body. I had buried Catherine upright. Now my soul began to experience the despair and suffering of being upside down, head down, feet up. My resentment grew stronger and stronger. With every ounce of resentment, my hair would grow an inch longer. A long, long time passed. It started to rain. The dry riverbed began to fill with water. 
Many years later, a girl fished me out. The girl was terrified, but her mother told her to pull me up. After I was dragged to shore, the girl's mother rummaged through my body. She didn't find anything valuable and had an idea. Her hair is as smooth as silk, black and long. It must be worth a lot of money. Then she took a pair of scissors and began to cut my hair. As she cut, she said, Child, I'm also doing this for your own good. You're only wearing a territory cloth. I'm afraid you won't be able to bribe the underworld officials down there. It's better that I cut off your hair, sell it for money, and burn some paper money for you. From the moment the girl fished me out of the river, my resentment and my memories were all gone. All I wanted was to be reincarnated. But before reincarnation, I have to get back what belonged to me. So I possessed the body of a recently deceased female beggar. I begged all the way to the woman's house, knocked on her door, and said, I'm here, give me back my money. The woman rolled her eyes, child, are you out of your mind? Later, seeing me dressed in rags and alone, she assumed I was helpless and said, Marry my son, marry my son, and I'll guarantee you food and shelter. Not long after I married her son, a great drought struck and famine descended upon the land. My senior brother and I both fell in love with our junior sister. But our junior sister clearly preferred senior brother. They eloped and were never heard from again. I searched for my junior sister desperately, but to no avail. It wasn't until the famine arrived that I sensed a trace of her aura in the body of a simple-minded woman. I finally learned that my senior brother, for the sake of immortality, had cultivated a forbidden technique, using our junior sister, wrapped in red and with an iron weight around her neck, as an immortality pillar. I was turned into a mortality pillar by the senior brother I loved most. My body and soul were buried in the river, enduring the torment of fish and insects. I was filled with hatred and anger. I swore that if I ever got out, I would make my senior brother pay. But when a girl born in the year of the tiger fished me out, I lost all my memories. All I wanted was to be reincarnated. I sought out the girl's mother to retrieve my belongings, hoping to use them to pass through the gates of the underworld. But her mother forced me to stay. I thought to myself, even if I'm reincarnated, I'll still have to live a life. Why not just live on in this beggar's body? But when the famine came, I was humiliated, beaten, and scolded. The neighbors mocked and ridiculed me mercilessly. Until I died, the memories of my past life came flooding back. I was consumed by resentment, using my hair as a weapon to kill everyone who had hurt me, everyone who had humiliated me. My junior sister was slaughtering villagers. This was against the natural order. I should have stopped her. But I loved her. All I could do was keep her safe. That was why I defied heaven and transferred her soul into the body of the girl born in the year of the tiger. After this, I thought I could finally live peacefully with my junior sister and the corpse infant she had given birth to.